Hi, good evening everyone and uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today this evening for this panel discussion. Uh, it's a Friday evening and I can still see a large number of participants today. Uh, that speaks to the importance of the subject and the fabulous lineup of speakers we have for this evening. The issue is obviously important and to use a rather cliched and overused phrase, we are currently at a turning point in international relations. It has been 75 years since the current UN system was founded and it's clearly showing signs of age. The balance of global power today that is considerably different from 1945 and of course the hopes with which the UN was set up in 1945, one could argue that somewhat some of these missions have been unfulfilled even during the Cold War days. The UN Security Council for much of the Cold War period did not act to preserve international peace and security, primarily because it was deadlocked due to the Cold War politics. And the General Assembly has been generally essentially toothless. Though the UN and its agencies did commendable work in the social sector and in many other aspects of global governance, these were overshadowed by the global political context. Three decades after the end of the Cold War and potentially the beginning of a new one, I think it is obviously time to consider what the challenges today are and what can be done in shaping the UN for this new emerging challenge. So my role this evening is to facilitate some thoughts from this terrific panel. We have three eminent panelists out here. I'll start with the uh, with the order. Um, uh, Ambassador Vikram Swami. He is Adjunct Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, India. Uh, Mr. Manuel Lafon Rapnoy. Director, Center for Pla Analysis, Planning and Strategy, CAPS, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, France, and Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, former Assistant Secretary General, United Nations, India. So let's get started and I'll go in the order that is given in the agenda. But just one more thing before uh, I hand it over to Ambassador Dwarai Swami from the technical side, uh, please keep yourself muted till you're going to be speaking so that we can avoid any line uh, disturbance, but muted, but not uh, your camera off, so keep it on. And also for the Q&A segment, there is a Q&A function at the bottom. So please feel free to leave your questions there and we may not be able to take all questions uh, given that virtual platforms even events are only about one hour. So we'll try. I'll, I'll try in my uh, best to kind of take as many questions as possible. Um, so without further ado, let me hand it over to Ambassador Dwarai Swami for, for his interve intervention first. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you through ORF and on this virtual panel. Uh, I'm also delighted to join, uh, as I said earlier, my first boss in service, Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, who, who's been an icon in our service, greatly respected, and of course, Manuel uh, Font Rapanui for all his incisive writings on strategic affairs and on uh, international issues. Um, I think your four questions to present the argument are interestingly worded, if I may a little provocatively worded too, because essentially they set set up two broad uh, sets of thought. One, that there is a, a challenge in the international architecture, and two, that without addressing this challenge in the international architecture, architecture the current situation that we face, the, the current global challenge that the pandemic has brought before us has sort of sharpened these contradictions and necessitated uh, or at least brought forth afresh the need for reform. Um, I'd like to somewhat, um, you know, in fairness to the United Nations and the international architecture, I'd like to suggest that perhaps we need to look at this with a slightly broader and a more uh, kind lens in terms of how the UN has evolved and the international architecture has evolved over the last 75 years. As you correctly said in your opening remarks, there are two big junction points. The 1945 period where uh, not so much idealism, but privation, war weariness, and a sense that the world owed itself to do something better, saw us through an initial period where despite the challenges of the Cold War, despite the challenges of uh, block politics, hugely transformative things like decolonization, the end of apartheid, uh, hugely ambitious agenda items like creating uh, international organizations for specific um, issues like world health, like uh, labor, 
like uh, children's rights, um, like cultural and social rights. Each of these things were created. So, you know, um, let's not call it idealism. Let's call it pragmatism. The world recognized the need to do better and the world did deliver better. Your second major junction point is the 1990s with the early 1990s with the end of the Cold War. Another opportunity to go beyond block politics, to go beyond the functional challenges of dealing with two very um, rigid divisions uh, uh, groups in the world and a third sort of block of uh, a larger block, if you will, of countries that were, uh, so to speak, non-aligned at that point of time. If you look at it, that was an opportunity to also try and create a, a, a new way of moving forward. To some extent, I would say some of the criticisms that are implicit in your questions are more appropriate for that period, because I think um, the focus then was on sort of uh, treating with a broader lens a range of challenges as challenges to peace and security, which has essentially left left us today with the uh, with the structural problems that we today talk about, which is the Security Council. Is it fully representative? Is the Security Council dealing with everything that it needs to deal? Should it deal with more? Should it deal with less? These are both political problems, but also reasonable problems of uh, of definition uh, reach, if you will, in terms of political reach. Should we be reaching this, this far? Should we be handling these things in this way? And uh, in a sense, competence with so many organizations and structures in the international system that set out an opportunity to deal with problems ranging from human rights to the environment to narrowly defined issues of peace and security, are we well served by broadening the lens? I'm not taking a position on that, but I do think that this is something that requires greater thought. Overall, I would say my own inclination would be to give the UN the benefit of the benefit of, uh, you know, uh, even with hindsight to recognize that it has done the best possible job that it was allowed to do, given the challenges before before the world that the international structures have broadly delivered to the extent that they were mandated to. It is not fair to expect an institution to do more than it is mandated to do. The consequent question that should be asked is therefore, what should we be doing? Should the mandates be changed? Should the structures be reformed? To which of course the answer is obviously yes, of course, all of the above. Mm -hmm. No organization, no structure, no entity, whether it is national or supranational, can survive, you know, being frozen in time. Uh, there was a context, a valid context in 1945 or 1950 or 1952, depending on which organization you look at, which may have since lived its purpose. Your questions, for instance, talk about the WHO and the WTO. Each of these also served a purpose at a particular point of time and delivered as well as their mandates could allow them. This is why our Prime Minister today, when he talks about the WHO, he says there is a need for uh, resourcing, uh, more resourcing, and also to look at the mandates of the WHO again. Uh, this includes looking at the mandate of the WHO in terms of the IHRs. Are, is, are the IHRs broad-based enough to deliver what we need to deliver, looking at where global health is positioned in a larger globalized context? I would think those are the questions that we need to address. Our own thinking as India is that multilateralism matters. What we need is reformed multilateralism. That's my six minutes. Thank you. Thank you. That was a terrific, uh, crisp uh, uh, six minute uh, remarks on some of the important issues. I, my oversight, I forgot to make a slightly larger introduction. Uh, something that you have, of course, uh, had a stellar career in the Ministry of External Affairs, but something that is uh, kind of uh, impressed upon uh, looking at some of the last of the thing is uh, you're uh, moving to the headquarters in July 2018. Uh, you were uh, head of the uh, B uh, uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar, but Later on in 2019, he went on to create the new division within the MEA, the Indo-Pacific. I think that's uh, uh, that's a lot to, in the contextual current context. I think that's particularly interesting. And of course, since uh, December 2019, you are the actual secretary responsible for international organizations and summits. Um, so that's fantastic. And uh, let me move on to the second speaker uh, for this evening. Uh, that is. Uh, <coughs> We have uh, uh, Mr. Manuel uh, Lafont Rapnoy. 
Uh, he is the uh, he's currently the has been the director of, of the Center for Analysis, Planning and Strategy. Cats are the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs since July 2019. Uh, a career diplomat, he has worked most particularly on international peace and security as well as on multilateral affairs. Uh, but he's also worn uh, different uh, hats uh, in the think tank uh, hats as well. Uh, in, uh, he has worked in two think tanks, two leading think tanks, international think tanks, the Washington based the Center for Inter uh, Strategic and International Studies uh, from 20, uh, 2008 to 2010. And most recently, the European Council for, on Foreign Relations, uh, for which he was the head of the Paris office and senior policy fellow from 2015 to 2019. Again, impressive work on multilateral organization as well as peace and security. Um, uh, so I don't think we could have had somebody better to uh, give a voice from the European kind uh, European context. Um, so over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Rup uh Thank you. And I'm very pleased to to be to be here. I had the chance to meet Ambassador Doraswamy under his previous position and we discussed the Indo-Pacific. So I'm happy that our, the scope of our discussions uh, expand under his new uh, position. Congratulations for that. And uh, I, I'm happy to have the chance, at least virtually, to meet with Ambassador Puri, but uh, working on the, the issues I've worked on, I've uh, uh, my past, I've uh, crossed, uh, a name has crossed my past uh, quite a few times, so I'm, I'm delighted to be part of the panel and I'm very happy that uh, uh, this conversation, uh, important conversation, is uh, had precisely with a with a European voice. Uh, so I, I'll I'll actually agree with a lot of uh, what uh, Ambassador Doraswamy already said. So I'm not going to uh, to reiterate that. Just let me add a few a few things. Uh, uh, as the UN lived up to its ideal, no, obviously, but that's what ideals are for. They are pushing us. Uh, further, still, it has delivered on a number of uh, of issues. If you look at the history of uh, UN Nobel Prizes, uh, the UN and its various agencies and personnel uh, have been recipient of the US Peace Nobel Prize over ten times, uh, and that's on a number of very various issues. You have the uh, IAEA on nuclear affairs, you have the OPCW on chemical weapons. You have a few on humanitarian affairs, uh, refugees, UNICEF. You have the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that doesn't necessarily make all these resp all these issues, all these actions of the UN on these uh, areas very effective. But that also shows that maybe part of the responsibility uh, has to do with uh, member states. And that brings me to uh, a famous Dag Amarschold quote, a, a former Secretary General another recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, which actually echoes what uh, uh, Ambassador Doraswamy said. It, his quote is, the UN was not created in order to bring us to heaven, it's, uh, uh, but to save us from hell. Um, <laughs> obviously, if, if it was just that, that wouldn't be very satisfying. You want more than just being saved from hell. So how do we, how do we push uh, the UN? Uh, further, that's the question. Is is the organization still relevant today? I would argue that it is. I would argue that it is because we need common rules, especially in the level of uncertainty and diversity that the world has now, the level of complexity. We need common rules for stability and for prosperity. Do we need cooperation? Of course, we need more cooperation. We need more cooperation because global affairs, global challenges like health, we see that very vividly now, but climate, biodiversity, desertification, uh, you name it, these issues call for cooperation. They won't be solved. If I solve them in my country, actually, it comes back from the rest of the world. We need it because we need universalism. We are right now at a moment of fragmentation of the world where everybody uh, is uh, basically saying my rules are enough. I don't have to listen to other people's interests or other people's rules. And we need that kind of universalist approach to these common issues and problems that we have because that's what makes our coexistence possible. We need more solidarity at a moment where the my country first uh, a trend is really uh, very strong. Uh, we need multilateralism, uh, more multilateralism, because we need less unilateralism. Uh, but of course, it doesn't mean that it is relevant under its current form. And that's why reform uh, is quite important. Uh, I understand, uh, especially in the case of India, that there's a lot of focus when you discuss the reform of the UN uh, that uh, uh, actually looks at the UN Security Council, especially its membership 
that's very legitimate and that's why the French position is well known. I believe that we support an expansion of the Security Council membership in the two categories. So that means including uh, uh, permanent members and India is one candidate that we are backing for a permanent uh, member seat. But there's a broader agenda of reform, uh, which is important. People who are attending this uh, webinar may have heard of the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is an initiative that we took in France with our German colleague. Uh, India is much and more, uh, more and more involved in that. And that is a group of countries who basically believe that uh, we're, we're neither against multilateralism, nor are we for status quo. We want multilateralism, but that doesn't mean uh, we should be fine with uh, status quo. So what what do we change uh, really is the question, and I think that's uh, one of the issues uh, that we uh, need to, to discuss uh, today. And again, the UN Security Council is an important reform. Its membership is an important reform. Uh, but imagine that right now we have an enlarged uh, Security Council. Do you really believe that that would make the coexistence in the Council between the US and China and Russia any easier? It's, it's probably not just about membership. And the fact is that the rest of the UN system, the problem is not so much a membership issue. So membership is important for a number of reasons, and I'm happy to expand on that. But I believe that <laughs> with uh, uh, the people who are uh, on the panel and the people who are attending, there's no need to go further on that. But the rest is important uh, too. Today, the, the Alliance for Multilateralism that I mentioned has a meeting later uh, this evening uh, that will have uh, uh, that will be dealing with the reform of the global health architecture. Um, I, I think I don't need to explain why that's important, but I'm happy to take questions uh, on that too. Is the UN useful, and I'll go more quickly on the two last questions, is the UN useful in domain which are outside of the purview of states? Uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, it is. It doesn't mean that's enough, but it is. Um, there's, there's actually an article in the charter that says that non-governmental uh, uh, entities and organizations need to be uh, included uh, in the UN's work. The UN has worked with others for a number of years, but it needs to do that more. Um, one of the reasons why the, the, the COP21 in Paris succeeded in bringing us the Paris climate deal is that there was a huge outreach work made from us, from diplomats, toward non-state actors, companies, NGOs, foundations, local governments, you name it, but also because then these entities, these actors then pushed back on states to forge the kind of consensus that was needed to get the climate uh, uh, deal. It, we have the, the Paris Peace Forum, which is held every year in uh, November, which has a lot to do with precisely pushing for this so-called multi-stakeholder approach. We have a number of various stakeholders, stakeholders various, uh, varied in their nature. We need to bring them on board. And uh, I mentioned the uh, Alliance for Multilateralism already quite a few times. One of the issues discussed today is the fight against infodemics, the epidemics of uh, uh, manipulation of information, of uh, mm -hmm. false news. Um, that initiative is actually not just uh, uh, supported by non-state actors, but it is uh, heralded by non-state actors and states are the one coming in support to it. And it's very important that civil society mobilizes and that we, we uh, strengthen it. Last question is on the impact of great power competition. Of course it has an impact, the, this kind of uh, insistence put on, on the more competitive view of the international system. But it's a very different impact if you have a vacuum as a consequence of this competition. And we know that uh, the US, uh, to name uh, the, the uh, elephant in the room, uh, the US has withdrawn uh, from uh, UNESCO, uh, from the Human Rights Council, wants to withdraw from the World Health Organization, as pulled out from the uh, Iran nuclear deal. This vacuum is makes a very different landscape for the competition that in, in the contrary, if you invest in the multilateral system. It's different also if you create a parallel network of institutions. And there are several elephants in the room. Another elephant is China. Uh, China mm -hmm. is creating a set of institutions. It's investing more in the UN, but it's also creating parallel institutions. Mm -hmm. When we are pushing for the Paris Peace Forum, it is to support the existing institution. It's not to create something separate and different. So th these kind of diverse options that we have set a, a very different landscape. And I think that's what we need to be uh, mindful of. 
taking into account that even at the height of great power competition under the previous era, the one Ambassador Dawaswami mentioned, the Cold War, well, you were still able to cooperate on issues like ranging from smallpox uh, to arms control and non-proliferation. So that, that's a good uh, setup, I think, for our conversation. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, you managed to cover a great deal in that, in that six minutes. Uh, I'm going to come back uh, with some questions of my own uh, uh, after the three presentations, after the last presentation is over. Uh, before I invite Ambassador Puri, let me just in, uh, remind the audience that we have a Q&A uh, function possible. Q&A icon is sort of that, uh, at the bottom of the screen, so please feel free to uh, drop your questions there and we'll take as many as possible. Uh, moving to the last but not the least, uh, speaker for the evening is Ambassador uh, Lakshmi Puri. Uh, she's a former Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations and the former Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. She again has had a stellar career at the uh, Ministry of External Affairs before moving into the uh, United Nations where she has done a great deal of work. She again has a long CV but her work with regard to women at the UN is is something very remarkable. Um, so I am very glad to have her kind of uh, wealth of experience um, uh, to speak to us today about the UN issues. UN, it's a momentous uh, time in the history to to take stock of and where we are going from here. So over to you, Ambassador Puri. Thank you very much and very timely dialogue. Uh, yesterday was the, I think, UN Charter Day. And uh, so, uh, it's wonderful to also uh, join these uh, very distinguished pan panelists, Ambassador Dore Swami, Ambassador Rapnoy. And of course, I agree with um, almost everything that you have said. But let me begin. You mentioned about uh, my um, UN women um, uh, stint but, um, and commitment. Let me begin uh, with a thought from uh, my feminist hero, Gloria Stanheim. Uh, and it echoes something that Vikram said. Like the spider spinning its web, we create much of the outer world from within ourselves. The universe is a joint product of the observer and the observed. And here, the multilateral system anchored in the UN is the web that the member states have spun from 1945 onwards and we have created a global governance universe and operated it for 75 long years with mixed results. And its achievements are many, but yes, to answer the question that was put, has it achieved its full potential? It hasn't and it has not been enabled to achieve its full potential. The other, uh, now what are those achievements? Of course, uh, both uh, Vikram and uh, Ambassador Apnoi have mentioned uh, what some of those are, but let me just, uh, as someone who was from within the UN Secretariat for the last 15 years, let me also say that in our, uh, in my experience, and I've also been on the other side, in my experience, I think the greatest value of the UN has been setting global norms and standards and values and rules of the game in different areas and being the head of the curve in terms of anticipating uh, issues that are of global importance and national importance, of course, to all countries. And then it is the being the authoritative knowledge uh, hub, being a movement builder for global public goods related transformations, transformations in policy, transformations in mindset and mobilizing the people around it and climate action and SDGs is, an, is, is a great example of all of this. Similarly, it's about being an we the governments and we the people and your question about inclusive multilateralism you know private sector and uh, and civil society engaging and contributing and participating in decision making is something that is also very much a contribution of the UN 
and then the programs on the ground. And then I think some of those uh, health, nutrition, education of children, eradication of diseases, reducing maternal mortality, promoting gender equality. And then you have the soft issues and then you have the hard issues of disarmament that was that were mentioned. Now, in all of those areas, of course, there is much that has been achieved, but much to be uh, still, um, you know, uh, to be uh, still achieved and um, the potential is hardly realized. So and uh, so yesterday, SGUN talked about um, a few challenges and why that potential could not be achieved. Uh, he talked about the challenges of scale, ambition, teeth. And um, also the dysfunctional big power relations, contestations, and through the first Cold War, and now, you know, he also referred to the Thucydides trap, uh, you know, between US and China, the kind of uh, Cold War II that is emerging, all of that will have and has, you know, will continue to roil the capacity of the UN to deliver. So the shortcomings are due to the power play of dominant member states, which often leads to emasculation of UN as an objective instrument of right policy and action or worse, paralysis or distortion or even being used as flags of convenience for unilateral action. So that is something that we have to deal with. And uh, all institutions have suffered the pulls and pressures of big power politics. And of course, COVID-19, WHO is an example, but also United, uh, UNSC. And its record is also given, uh, you know, is a case in point. And while you may be right, Ambassador Aknui, that structure or, or expansion alone will not solve the problem of UNSC, but you also have to, uh, to go back to what Vikram said, we also have to do something about mandates and decision making processes. They need to be reformed too in, in the context of UN, UN Security Council. And of course, this whole issue of uh, we may have averted World War III, but multiple local wars and perilous interventions, use of force for regime change have been either not stopped by the UN Security Council or even being blessed. And also we have the issues of terrorism, the countering terrorism, whilst the UN has set up institutional uh, uh, mechanisms, we have not been effective. We don't have a convention yet and so on. So all of these and also the Secretary General of the UN, and this is what I observed when I was uh, in the with this current Secretary General. I will observe that the Secretary General UN's prevention, peacemaking, peace building agenda and the ability for the UN to do something has been uh, frustrated. Now, of course, I agree with the previous speakers that if the UN did not exist, we would need to invent it. But also the fact that we need to have a new incarnation of the UN and which means that uh, and, and the context has changed. 1945, we had 51 states, now 193 states, and there is an evolution in who those states are. And uh, so we need to have uh, a more representative structure at, in all bodies, organs and bodies, and also the decision making processes, which brings together the actors, as you say in your uh, questions, the actors that matter. Population, size of the economy, capacity to contribute to global public goods. This is a very important indicator peace and security, sustainable development, climate change action, you know, so that criteria plus the charter's uh, affirmation of equal rights of nations, you know, so all of that is very important. 
And then, of course, everyone has, um, I think Vikram began with uh, saying that uh, COVID-19 is a watershed point. And uh, just like World War II pushed us into reimagining uh, or, or setting up or imagining uh, the, uh, you know, uh, elements of uh, uh, the what we have as the multilateral system uh, anchored in the United Nations, we also now have an opportunity to reimagine and reinvent the UN. And to address its uh, to redress its weaknesses and you know build on its strengths. Very quickly, I would like to um, uh, mention also, uh, particularly this came through very well in, uh, and it has come through even in the UN Security Council. I mean, I have had some uh, interaction there, and Vikram, of course, has been uh, working uh, during U uh, India's. Uh, membership of the Security Council. So any restructuring and reform must reinforce impartiality, technical excellence and expertise and authoritative voice and independence of the institutions, both in terms of the secretariat and more representative governance structures of organs and agencies and insulate them from great power pressures. Mandate review, and strengthening of various institutions and of course financial viability that Vikram referred to is very and independence is very very and stability is very very important. Uh, the other aspect that I want to quickly mention is that uh, uh, the great disruptor of technology in the fourth industrial revolution and the impact on the world of work, media, uh, artificial intelligence, IT and the Internet of all things, the zero marginal cost economy, basic minimum income solutions, the social and human rights impact of all of that. UN can be equipped to be the global technology and innovation tracker, aggregator, advisor and norm setter in this uncharted areas to you know, help the world also cooperate and, and have shared responsibility, shared values and cooperate in these areas. And indeed, uh, multi-stakeholder participation, deepening of that, I already mentioned inclusive multilateralism and uh, it's about we the people uh, of the charter being uh, more engaged, but also important stakeholders like the private sector uh, making their contribution and you know the agenda 2030 very clearly acknowledges this there is uh, this mutual accountability established for uh, taking uh, for achieving SDGs uh, together. Uh, political capture I think um, it's it's been mentioned but one of the main uh, means of political capture is uh, Firstly, of course, the way they have been structured, the, the different institutions have been structured, whether it is Bretton Woods or the UN, uh, but it's also the financial clout uh, and contributions um, that uh, countries make. And that is something we will need to uh, re, um, you know, reconfigure so that we have, uh, as I said before, an independent authoritative Multilateral uh, institutions for and 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 enable recovery in every way. So Thank these you. are some of the ideas that uh, I have by this point. But uh, certainly we will uh, come back when uh, questions come before us. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador Thank Puri. You, Ambassador I think that's Puri. a very forceful presentation. Uh, I think this is quite a bit of echo. Uh, independent uh, of the institutions, representative institutions. I think there are a lot of different issues that you bring out in your presentation, in your uh, speech. Uh, but let me now quickly jump into some of the uh, points that you all three of the few touched upon uh, in varying degrees in a sense. I think one of the key questions is the uh, reforms issue. 
uh, the uh, reforms in terms of the UN Security Council reform. This has been blocked by various regional problems in a sense. And since all of you touched upon that particular point, and also since India is a candidate in this regard, uh, I think it'll be particularly interesting to hear your thoughts on a few specific aspects in a sense. Uh, for instance, the political problems in Europe, problems between Germany and Italy. Uh, in Asia, there are uh, a set of problems of similar kinds. Uh, so do you think we have reached a political climate to resolve some of the regional issues? Is the time ripe to address some of these issues? I would start with uh, uh, Ambassador Rapnoe, if I can, if that's okay. Um, it's it's hard to believe that the time is ripe. Uh, one of the uh, latest uh, initiatives that France undertook uh, in the UN Security Council is to push for a resolution that would have had the Security Council to support the call by the UN Secretary General for a truce, a humanitarian truce in the context of the COVID pandemics. And that failed, uh, uh, I, I must say, very, uh, very sadly, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, it was sad that this opportunity to have an impact in a situation that in many situations, uh, conflict situations which are dire uh, was a problem and it was uh, sad to see that other interests and motives uh, were strong enough to uh, make this attempt uh, fail. So um, it's hard to see uh, the context as, uh, as really uh, conducive to these efforts, but uh, surely at the same time, uh, there's uh, an even stronger need uh, to do that. Uh, if you look, you don't even have to think of uh, COVID-19 and uh, both the health and the economic impact of the pandemic to think that uh, we can't really afford to uh, spend so much time on conflict uh, uh, management and that we ought to uh, be on conflict resolution mode. Uh, but even that, that pandemics and its economic impact is making this uh, even more uh, important. And that's why there are a number of situations uh, where uh, we are pushing for these kind of, of efforts. And it's one of the important role that the UN has. Uh, it's in the meantime, until the international community or until the key states, the key actors are actually uh, uh, willing uh, and able to uh, enter, to step into that uh, uh, conflict resolution uh, mode, into the settlement process. The UN is one of the key actors to prevent the conflict to deepen or to spread uh, uh, regionally. Um, and, and that is why uh, we are still uh, uh, very active nonetheless. Right now, for instance, there's a lot of discussion in New York about what do we do in Mali? And I think uh, many of uh, people attending this event have heard about the situation in the Sahel. So it's not just in Mali, it's a situation that can spread, that can have various destabilizing effects with terrorism, uh, with migration and de de demographic issues, with starvation, etc., uh, and, and political stability. It's important that the UN is uh, at least able to play this role. And it's one of the of the trends that I'm seeing now. I'm not just seeing a, a trend where the efforts that you can undertake at the UN to, to bring peace to conflict-torn, war-torn countries are made more difficult, but there may be even less interest for uh, the kind of uh, uh, peacekeeping, uh, uh, waiting for the actual peace-building uh, yeah. phase, but even that kind of stage of action is, is more difficult these days. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but that's that's my assessment of the situation. You are realistic. Uh, thank you. Uh, to let me come to uh, Ambassador Doreswami. I think there is also some questions, so I will link up uh, that from the, uh, the questions from the audience. So, I, given the political issues that continue to plague the multilateralism platforms and so on and so forth, uh, is there a principle that can be evolved to resolve in terms of looking at the uh, UNSC reforms? Um, and there's a specific question to ask uh, for you. Could you please identify some of the key elements of reformed multilateralism? Is it gaining traction internationally. Um, so Ambassador Dorai Swami. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me say, I think, um, you know, the points that Ambassador Puri uh, put out essentially put into perspective the larger question of reform. Uh, reform is, you know, it isn't a one stop fix. It is there isn't just a single point that constitutes reform. So if you look at the discourse of our, about UN reform, more particularly UN Security Council reform, 
the discourse has not just been about who gets to occupy a new seat, but also how the process works. How do you get the process to work a little bit better? So obviously this is what we're talking about. The, in, the intention is to cover not just the representation portion of it, but also the functional portion of it. Okay. The, 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 the working method of the Security Council, what structures and mechanisms of the Security Council do need to be re-examined. Re do they need to be re-examined? How do they need to be re-examined? In this, there are uh, there are those countries, the uh, you know the group of small states earlier called the S4 group, for instance, which put forward the idea that working method reform is equally important. Sure, of course. Who would disagree with that? I mean, the idea is not to perpetrate, uh, sort of perpetuate the logjam in any particular form uh, beyond what already exists. Uh, I think um, Manuel also makes the point very well that look, you have a series of challenges and crises. And the question is, are you looking at conflict management or conflict resolution? And the UN has moved substantially towards the idea of conflict resolution. So to the point that is being made about what does reform include and what is reformed multilateralism, the idea is obviously to get beyond the notion of just trying to manage a conflict to actually try and help create the mechanism for conflict resolution. The, the third point of this is is also to recognize that there are certain uh, phenomena that remain fundamental to any examination of the problem of uh, peace and security. You know, the notion that our increasingly globalized world is more prone to threats than ever before. The idea that terrorism has essentially, it may have been an, ex existent, uh, an existing problem even in the 1880s and onward, but it has been weaponized and certainly been greatly en enabled by the dissemination of new forms of technology, by far more anonymous systems of movement of funds, by capacities of uh, state and non-state actors to, to operate beyond borders. All of this also creates a set of challenges. So any effort to reform needs to be reduced down to fundamental principles. What is it that we seek to reform? It isn't just to reform uh, representativeness, which is of course one important part of it, because you you increase the level of buy-in to, to processes by increasing the number of actors who have a sense of a feeling of a stake in the issue. But you also you try and improve the notion of working methods. You improve the notion of uh, issues that need to be that need to be brought together. You can indeed increase the coverage of issues that need to be uh, addressed. How you do it, what you do, what you do with it, that is the process part of it. Obviously, at this point of time, no state is going to put its cards on the table and say, well, these, these are all the things I mean by reform, because a reform, a, a process of reform is fundamentally a process of negotiation. And in a negotiation, nobody goes there with all his cards, his or her cards on the table and says, you know, these are my cards. Let's figure out which ones you can trump first to start with. And okay. No pun intended. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Swami. And a uh, quick question on that uh, UN reforms issue for Ambassador Puri uh, is the problem with veto, for instance. Uh, new members can come without veto power. That's been the view circulated for some time. Uh, what do you think of it, especially being having been in the UN system? How does that debate uh, flag? And uh, what are the kind of concerns that have been raised in the, some of the debates? Well, I think. Um, um, as has been mentioned before, what is really important is how do we take decisions in the highest body that is that has teeth, let us say. You know, this one of the few bodies, UN Security Council, that has teeth. But then how do you take decisions within that body is uh, what is important to reform and uh, veto yeah. has the the P5 have the veto and typically what has happened in the past is because of this first the Cold War contestation and then even a continuation of that in some form or the other uh, and now we don't know how it's going to work further there's going to be paralysis. There will always be, well, there will be one side that will propose and the other side will veto. 
So there is this whole question of whether the veto is helpful to effective decision making in the Security Council and that needs to be reviewed. Okay. And then, you know, then if we don't have the veto, then all permanent members are on an equal uh, platform and then decisions can be taken by majority of the wisdom and Vikram referred to that buy-in, but also it brings in more wisdom from uh, different lenses of development, of regions, uh, of experience, you know, into a particular, uh, and you know, Syria, Leban uh, well, Libya, all of these uh, different theaters of war which have really happened, uh, UN Security Council was, um, you know, ineffectual. Thank you. So uh, that is a very important aspect. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I think in uh, in view of uh, time constraint, I'm going to going to jump straight into the uh, Q and A. So there are a couple of important questions. One, I think it's a pertinent question uh, from one of the audience members. Uh, if India gains permanent membership within the UN Security Council, how will it avoid reproducing the great power foibles of the past? Is it inevitable that permanent members will always pursue their own interests on the council and whether hijack the international agenda, which is uh, something what we have seen in, in varying degrees uh, in the recent times as well. So that's one set of question. Uh, big power pressures in the UN function is here to stay. And do you believe that the era of globalization, uh, UN will be a reflection of the real world demands? Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Ambassador uh, 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 Rapnoi and then come to the two other speakers. Yes, sorry. Um, I, okay. I don't see I big power politics uh, uh, disappearing uh, anytime soon. So the <laughs> question is, how do we deal with it? Yeah. Um, and I don't think that the problem is that uh, uh, members of the Security Council, and that's not just the case for permanent members, pursue their own interest. The idea of multilateralism is how do you work together uh, rather than pursue your own interest uh, uh, on your own in a unilateral uh, basis. So the problem is not do we pursue you our own interest is the problem is the appetite for compromise, the appetite for discipline and respect of the international uh, law uh, of the norms and the commitments that we have taken and made for ourselves. Uh, and, and this is the basis for uh, asking others to uphold their part uh, of the commitment. And that is what I have seen uh, being uh, uh, weakened uh, or fragilized in the recent period. Mm -hmm. Part of this has to do with the fact that uh, not everybody is sure that multilateralism uh, works for everyone the same way. And, and you can hear quite a few major powers saying uh, uh, that, that's, that's not enough, that's not good enough for me or I'm doing too much for you guys. So part of it has to be uh, uh, burden sharing. Part of it has to do with the effectiveness of multilateral policies and the fact that our people, the, the citizen, and that's especially true for democratic uh, countries, say, well, your multilateral policies don't deliver. So how do we make these policies more effective? That's another angle of the important area of reform for the multilateral system, the, the public policies that we have in place. The current pandemic shows that our health, global health policies um, not really where uh, they ought to be uh, for global health uh, interests. But part of it has to do with uh, big power politics and the fact that uh, interests don't always uh, coincide. And my take on the veto is uh, the veto is a way for the major powers to uh, think that they have interest in investing in the UN because it won't be turned against them. Because they have the veto, they know it won't be turned against them. So it's kind of an insurance policy. You can play that game because that game is not going to be turned uh, against you. I've seen a question saying we should have a veto that is effective only if 50% of the veto welding power uh, 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 do have a veto. But then look, <laughs> you have a P5. Everybody know with, within the P5 there's a P3. If you're a <laughs> member of the two other permanent members, you're saying, OK, this rule is not going to work the same way for them than for me, so I don't I don't want that rule. One of the things that the, the, the French have pushed for is on, on, in terms of reforming the use of the veto is saying mass atrocities, for instance, should be 
put on the side and there should be a suspension of the veto in cases of mass atrocities because mass atrocities it's very hard to say that your national interests actually are that mass atrocities continue and and mass atrocities raise issues in terms of uh, international peace and security in terms of precedence of scale of atrocities that run against the cl collective global uh, interest and so there is this uh, french proposal about suspending the use of the veto in cases of mass atrocities it doesn't say anything about whether we should agree on on what what would the, the what's the response on which we should agree you would still need to have a majority on that response but as ambassador puri says you give a chance to the majority not just to one country who is willing to block the council and and doesn't feel the any pressure to come back with an alternative position in the case of syria this is really what we've seen we've seen a series of veto that have allowed for mass atrocities to continue for several years with major consequences way beyond syria and no not so much pressure in terms of okay but then if you don't like that answer what's your response Okay, thank you. Ambassador Doreswami. The great power politics and how that's going to play out. Well, there was a first question about um, India itself, which I suppose in fairness, um, uh, as one of the two Indians on the panel, one, one of us at least should try and respond to. Respond to. Um, if India gains a seat, how will it avoid great power contestation in pursuit of national interest? I don't think there is an expectation that any nation avoids national interests, uh, avoids the exercise of uh, uh, national interests. The question is within within reason. I think our track record, this will be our eighth uh, appearance on the UN Security Council. Um, we just got uh, elected earlier this uh, this month. Um, shows that a country the size and complexity of India uh, finds it very difficult to take a position that is inherently always going to be on one particular line. Our interests are complex. Our, our positioning as a virtue of where we are as a large uh, emerging economy, it's always going to be complex. It is very difficult for us to say we will instinctively always vote with, say, for purposes of argument with France. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure Manuel would like that. But I mean, the point is, it's not, it's not in the nature of things. Uh, for better or for worse, India has had its own position on a number of issues. Call it contrarian, but it certainly is in, a, in, in adherence to India's national interests. Is this a good thing? Obviously, from an Indian perspective, it is. But I would argue in a world that is rapidly being polarized again into, into sort of picking sides, it is important to have as much opportunity to broaden, broaden the conversation and to say that, look, there is side A and side B, but there is also a possibility of trying to find ways of bridging gaps. So again, for better or for worse, Indian diplomacy has largely tried in its long history to try and find bridging roles in many of these issues. Um, to the point that great power uh, pressures uh, operate upon the UN and reduce it and other international institutions capacity to cooperate. This is true, but it's also in the way you exercise function that you understand how to deflect uh, pressures and actually operate within it. Nations also operate in similar constraints. Uh, when um, when uh, India was last on the Security Council in, in the uh, beginning years of the last decade, uh, it's not as if there weren't pressures on India to vote in direction X or direction Y uh, by partners whom we value greatly. Uh, who are of important strategic importance to India. How we take a position is also dependent on both the nature of the issue and how we see it impacting upon our, our own interests. So too, in the international system, it is important to ensure that actors within the international architecture, that is international civil servants, are of the capacity and caliber and have the opportunity in the sense, structural opportunity to exercise the position for which they are elected or nominated. If it is going to be based on what the British would call Muggins turn, then you have a problem because if it's only Muggins turn, then Muggins will deliver Muggins results. So it's important to ensure that your system delivers the right sort of people. I mean, look at the quality of secretary generals that we had in the initial years of the United Nations. It was not 
an easy time. The Cold War had, uh, was upon us, but look at the luminous Doug Hammarskjöld, what he created by way of being able to stand up on both sides where the pressures were unfair. And with that, he also earned global respect because this was a man who was speaking truth to power, no matter which side it came from. So we must also expect that while the job is difficult, yeah. you don't go into the kitchen if you're afraid of the heat. And it is important for the international <coughs> civil service that mans the United Nations to also operate as a function of the purpose for which they're employed. Yes, it's true, we do need to give them more resources. We do need to ensure that financing is predictable. Uh, but mandates and the capacity to operate within the mandate is always up to you. You know, you can decide that the water is half full or you can decide like Grusho Marx once said, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador Fourier, I want you to look at another question, which is especially as a woman, I want you to kind of, I can't brush aside that particular point. Uh, what can be done so that the domestic violence and sexual harassment at workplace is taken up as a serious offense and get stopped? Because even after so many laws, there are continuing uh, 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 in, in incidents uh, on the runs, been on the rise. Um, um, the question says the, we require a social disruption to possibly um, to address this. Uh, how do you look at this particular issue, Ambassador Puri? Well, this is a vital issue yeah. which is uh, squarely in the realm of the larger project of gender equality and women's empowerment. And uh, freedom from violence and which and violence is the extreme form of discrimination against women and girls. So that is a fundamental right. And that's what we must emphasize in any context of gender equality and women's empowerment related policies and ecosystems. So it's not only, uh, you know, many countries treat it as a law and order issue or as you know uh, as a crime in the narrow sense but we have to look at it in the larger context of what uh, in in un women when we uh, when i was there we used to talk about the four p's and one a and so one is prevention protection provision of essential services and critical services to women who are affected and prosecution of perpetrators and one a is access to justice for victims so this is the whole uh, you know comprehensive holistic uh, you know prevention and response uh, ecosystem that we need to create and yes this is a you know it you require laws you require programs you require institutions uh, you require all agencies to be gender responsive, whether it's law enforcement to judiciary to, um, uh, you know, health systems. Everything is is uh, involved in making a comprehensive and in India, you know that there was a major, um, major uh, soul searching after the Nirbhaya incident. And, um, and and tragedy and and then that gave rise to uh, legislative change the Verma Commission report the legislative change and all that followed but of course uh, resources is a very important committing resources to this project is also very important absolutely uh, yeah ambassador Dharaswami if I may Please just comments. on this particular issue I think the point about social change is a really critical point. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, Ambassador Puri puts it really well because, you know, this is, it's not merely a gender issue. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a fundamental issue because you're actually talking about 50% of humanity here. And if, mm -hmm. if the notion that this is just passed off as a crime is acceptable, mm -hmm. then you immediately reduce the level of priority that it ought to take in a larger global sense. And this is not an issue that is restricted to a particular religious group or a particular set of countries. It's a global issue. So, you know, creating disruptive social change about it is critical. For instance, it should not be acceptable that people accused of gender violence 
or uh, or, or sexual harassment that should not be an acceptable thing for somebody to come back into normal society you should not be able to to have somebody in a position of authority an ambassador to the united nations for instance who has some such background yeah. it's it's not okay because this is not merely a matter of law and order where he or she, you know the particular person may have just been you know let off without with a warning in his or her country it's a it's an issue of being unacceptable absolutely if uh, I may just quickly, uh, you know, uh, stimulated by what uh, Ambassador Doreswami, he's very much uh, 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 what I would say he for she uh, in, in his belief systems. So I want to, of course, appreciate that very much, but also to say that, you know, in the COVID-19 context, uh, this violence, as you know, domestic violence in particular has gone up. And what I have been uh, saying is, that let us use this big, the great disruption, social and economic, of uh, the uh, COVID-19 to create a new normal in terms of the gender equality and women's empowerment uh, uh, ecosystem and agenda. And uh, certainly, uh, we used to also, there is another analogy. You know, we have referred to the fact that violence against women is a global pandemic. We have been saying this. At least 33% of women globally suffer from some form of violence or the other. So, uh, you know, when we talk about infection rates, yeah. the violence rates also, you know, amount to a pandemic. One, I think we are almost completely running out of time. One very final question, which I will also link it up to one of the points that are, which I wanted to raise, uh, the US-China uh, competition and how the there is a fragmentation of the multilateralism and the multilateral institutions. Uh, and are we seeing, witnessing a new global order or one of regional orders? And I think that's where my point also was that you see a host of inter the regional organization today, uh, which was absent in 1945. You have the European Union, Union, ASEAN, uh, African Union, and so on and so forth. So what kind of uh, relationship do you envisage between these regional institutions and the UN? Uh, is there a room for greater synergy between regional organizations and the UN? Uh, I think this will be the very last question. I, I wish we had more time. There is uh, plenty of questions that have come on to us, but I think uh, let's go in the reverse order. I'll start with Ambassador Puri and uh, then go to uh, Manuel and then to Ambassador Doreswani. So uh, multilateralism faces multiple challenges, as we have discussed, and the latest to them is that U.S. the dominant, and I, I think uh, Ambassador Rapnoe mentioned that U.S. the dominant superpower, 21 trillion economy, is in retreat and disengaging itself, except in a unilateral and transactional way. Okay, China, an authoritarian state model. New $14 trillion economy, Asian and global economic engine, and a globalization leader, and expansionist power, military power, is now uh, challenging the liberal democratic order. And I want to emphasize this liberal democratic order that the United Nations and multilateralism has pushed for. I mean, UN values are about liberal democratic order. So that's that's where we are. And and um, the Secretary General in his uh, sp uh, in his statement yesterday or in a question and answer, he talked about the risk that instead of having a global economy, we might move into two global spheres with different rules, with different internets, with different trade mechanisms and different dominant currencies and eventually with different artificially intelligent strategies with different military and geostrategic positions. So the, the need for multilateralism is doubly <laughs> now urgent right now, and, uh, but it's also facing a major, major challenge. At a time when actually COVID-19 should have you know, solidified the world together uh, towards uh, more inclusive, more effective, uh, and and uh, a multilateralism with shared responsibilities, shared values, 
shared uh, global public good delivery. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Rapnoi. Um, I, I often uh, hear this idea that maybe the, the way forward is a kind of regionalized order, several regional orders and uh, uh, every everyone on its own. I, I don't believe in that for many reasons. I don't believe in that because uh, there is no clear delineation of what the regions would be. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure Israel wants to be part of its regional order. I don't know which regional order you put Turkey. I'm sure Russia wants to be part of every regional order you can think of. Uh, I don't think China's neighbor wants to be in a, a Chinese centric uh, regional order. Of course, I'm a European, so I believe that regional orders are important. I believe that the EU, that NATO, that the OSC are contributing to the world order by creating or trying to create some time uh, fostering a regional order, but this is not sufficient. You need some kind of global order. And that's why this idea of the return of uh, exacerbated great power competition is so uh, uh, is of concern. I mean, great power competition was never a way, but the fact that it's exacerbated to the point that it's taking, uh, that it's trumping, uh, no pun intended, that it's trumping cooperation uh, is, is a problem, that it's unbound, that's the problem. So what, what we need to do is to say that this competition is legitimate for a number of reasons, but uh, uh, it needs to happen within rules, within red lines, uh, that it cannot uh, uh, suppress or, or attack spaces for cooperation. There are too many global common challenges that we need to deal with and which are pressing. Uh, and I mentioned climate change, we've just discussed about uh, uh, gender issue and sexual violence. There are so many of them. Uh, which are really important. And the UN is part of the effort to, to, to deal with that. Um, the, the Alliance for Multilateralism is precisely the idea that uh, we, we want to regroup those who are willing to try that kind of other approach. And for a country like India, for a country like France, I, I guess for most of uh, my EU uh, partners, of France EU's partners, uh, the idea that the China-US competition is all in the world, is exhausting all the rest, is clearly uh, uh, an issue. I mean, one of, one of the key uh, issue for uh, my foreign minister right now is Libya. Mm -hmm. The US is not so much there in Libya and China clearly is not there. It's not about China-US competition. The, the Russia is there, Turkey is there. Actually, a lot of people are there. We are there, the US are there too. Uh, but um, the problem is how do you deal with the fact that precisely there are many people around and not everybody wants to find a cooperative uh, and peaceful uh, solution to the conflict in Libya. So uh, uh, if, if you want to avoid that situation where at the end of the, of the day you will have to take side between these two options uh, and uh, um, that for a number of reasons this is, uh, I don't think this is the, the best option. Um, we need to insist on, on the idea of a cooperative and rules-based order. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's a positive note. Let me uh, hand it over to Ambassador Doreswami now. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me say, I think the um, point that uh, Manuel makes is a good one. That is fundamentally, you don't have to see a contradiction between regional cooperation mechanisms and a global uh, a global structure. Um, the EU, of course, has done extraordinarily well in trying to, you know, first they hash out their own positions and then they bring them to international organizations. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of blood on the floor when they finished internally, but once they come to uh, an international organization, there is a clear position and it and it and it works. Uh, the African Union, a comparatively newer organization, has also now started uh, cooperating with the UN Security Council, including in things like peacekeeping missions. You have an, uh, a hybrid uh, peace mission yeah. currently underway in, in Darfur. So, you know, um, there is an opportunity for regional organizations to deliver. Uh, and there is no necessary reason why a regional organization would be would find itself in contradiction with uh, with the international larger international order. The question is, how far are other actors who are sort of, you know, invitees, if you will, to the tent, uh, willing to play <coughs> within the boundaries that the tent circumscribes? If it's a small tent, are you going to bring the entire camel inside the tent or are you going to be content with putting just the front hooves inside? 
So this is a question that the owner of the tent, owners of the tent need to answer. It's not necessarily for other invitees of the tent who might already be feeling the squeeze to, to, to take that position. So, for, so, you know, to make to be less elliptical, what I'm trying to say is that regional bodies need to themselves decide what is the limits to their uh, to their tolerance of uh, of extra regional um, pressures. In terms of limits to competition, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, even in the heyday of the Cold War, there were limits to how far contestation would go. And it is important for all stakeholders of the international system to recognize that not participating in, in an institution or in sort of taking contestation, uh, taking competition to contestation is problematic. For this, it's important that all major powers, and I don't single out anyone in this, need to recognize that these are institutions that they own as much as other people. In fact, in a sense, a great power has, in a sense, like Spider-Man, greater responsibilities. It is up to you to ensure that the red that you demonstrate that you apply red lines when you bring it to, to an international organization. You can't at that point say, well, I'm a big country and you're small countries uh, and therefore you need to. That's just the way the world is. Doesn't work that way. Uh, as Manuel said, an alliance for multilateralism. This is important because fundamentally multilateralism is the democratic way. If you're saying one country, one one vote, then those of us who are countries that are based on one one person, one vote must must recognize that multilateralism is a logical extension of national democracy. And mm -hmm. finally, of course, the point about choosing. I, I don't think you could have a better summation uh, than what uh, 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 Minister Jim Hacker says when he asks his private uh, is told when he asks his private secretary, Bernard, if the chips were down, which side are you on? His answer is, Minister, it's my job to make sure the chips stay up. Thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, we are just 11 minutes past our schedule, but I couldn't stop this off. Uh, really beautiful, uh, terrific discussion on very pertinent questions, whether it is the reforms, whether it is a representative, more representative multilateral institution, the UN that we want to see, or in terms of even seeing uh, sort of a, uh, how do we essentially ensure that the great power politics don't hijack the multilateral institutions and the processes. Um, so I couldn't have stopped to um, uh, any of our panelists before this, uh, but uh, my special thanks to all three panelists for their time and their expertise and experience uh, brought in their uh, in their uh, speeches and their remarks. And thank you for taking on all the q and I think we have another two dozen questions. If we had the time, we would have done uh, a lot many more of these questions. Uh, thank you and uh, hand of applause to you. Thank you. Thanks so much.